I'm Richard Blumenthal, acting as the chairman in the stead of Senator Durbin, who is the chairman, and I'm joined by Senator Grassley of Iowa, the ranking member. Uh, today we're going to hear from five judicial nominees and one nominee to the Department of Justice. Toby Heitens has been nominated to the Fourth Circuit, two nominees to the Eastern District of Virginia, Patricia Giles and Judge Michael Nachmanoff, two nominees to the District of Connecticut, particularly proud of them, Sarah La Nagala and Judge Omar Williams, and uh, finally Hampton Dellinger, who's been nominated to serve as Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Office of Legal Policy. I'm going to introduce the Connecticut nominees. We'll be joined shortly by two more of our colleagues, uh, Senator Murphy and Senator Coons, who right now are in a Foreign Relations Committee markup. But before I introduce uh, Ms. Nagala and Judge Williams, I have a few broad observations about the judicial, judicial nominees before us today. These nominees are superlative. They are spectacularly qualified, and they represent a continued effort by the Biden administration and Senate Democrats to elevate individuals with impeccable credentials and experience, deep experience in the courtroom and in our judicial system to our federal judiciary. This slate of nominees also offers professional balance. We're going to hear from sitting judges, former public defenders, a federal prosecutor, and a legal academic and appellate expert. As someone who has spent his life, my life, in the courtroom, basically as a litigator, I'm particularly proud of these nominees and really all the nominees we've seen so far from President Biden. And they offer varied perspectives that are too often missing from the bench. Our federal courts and courts of appeals are well served when they reflect the full spectrum of professional legal experience, as well as individuals who look like America and represent the values of diversity and inclusion that we all prize. And just as important, these nominees have been selected because they have the hallmarks of what makes a really good judge. Independence, fidelity to the rule of law, and respect for every individual, every individual who comes into their courtrooms. Under the Trump administration, we encountered nominees who were selected specifically because of outcome-driven approaches to jurisprudence. And I am very gratified and relieved that the Biden administration is choosing nominees because of their qualifications and open-mindedness. Two of the nominees before us today exemplify these qualifications and qualities. Ms. Nagala received her BA from Stanford University and her JD from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. After law school, she clerked for Judge Susan Graber on the Ninth Circuit and worked for a well-known preeminent law firm, Munger, Tolles, and Olson in San Francisco for three years. For nearly a decade, Ms. Nagala proudly served the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Connecticut, the office that I headed for four and a half years. She served as an assistant United States Attorney, and she worked particularly in the office's human trafficking and hate crimes section. She was the coordinator for that work. In this role, she was instrumental in the prosecution of Baitul Uman, a mosque shooter. Her years of experience as a federal prosecutor will be invaluable for the District of Connecticut as a judge. I'd also like to add that Ms. Nagala, if confirmed, will be the first person of Asian and South Asian descent to serve as an Article III judge in the District of Connecticut, and I am thrilled, just to repeat, can't repeat too many times, that 
President Biden continues to nominate individuals who will bring personal and professional diversity to the federal bench. And I might just add also, Ms. Nagala has strong support from the legal community in Connecticut and from around the country, former pro federal prosecutors and criminal defense attorneys have written to us that Ms. Nagala is a, quote, fair and open-minded advocate who has effectively reached just results as a prosecutor. And I can tell you as a former United States attorney, there's no higher praise than to have your adversaries, adversaries only in the courtroom, public defenders say that you reach just results. Anti-trafficking advocates in Connecticut wrote to this committee that Ms. Nagala is a, quote, professional, diplomatic, and respectful, end quote, advocate, but also, quote, responsive and collaborative, end quote, and that if confirmed, she will be ethical, fair, and just, and will work to ensure the rights of all parties who come before her. The South Asian Bar Association of North America noted that Ms. Nagala's appointment will be profoundly meaningful, and I'm quoting, profoundly meaningful to the growing South Asian legal community across North America, and that her, quote, unwavering commitment to vulnerable populations ensure that she will serve with fairness, compassion, and humility, end quote. More than 40 of Ms. Nagala's former law firm colleagues also wrote to this committee to note that, quote, she adheres to the highest ethical standards and is committed to follow the law, end quote, and she will make a positive and longstanding contribution to the judiciary and the le legal system. I'm pleased that her nomination has come before this committee. Uh, I also want to introduce Judge Omar Williams, who received his BA in 1998 and his JD in 2002, both from the University of Connecticut. He has served as a judge on the Hartford Superior Court since 2016, but he first joined the bench in New London in 2014. So he has very, very substantial experience on the bench in state court already. But in the years between graduating from law school and becoming a judge, Omar Williams had an 11-year career as an assistant public defender in Connecticut, where he built a reputation as an accomplished and expert litigator and advocate. I know his experience as a public defender will undoubtedly provide an underrepresented and much-needed perspective to the federal judiciary. And without any aspersions on prosecutors, they are more likely to be represented on the federal bench than public defenders. So his nomination is particularly significant at this moment in our history. Judge Williams also serves on Connecticut's Sentence Review Division and Wiretap Panel, a position to which he was nominated by the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. The Chief Justice also selected Judge Williams to serve on the New England Regional opioid initiative, given his deep understanding of the challenges that the opioid epidemic imposes on the judicial system. Since taking the bench, Judge Williams has consistently, and I mean consistently and constantly, shown a level-handed, balanced approach to deciding cases, fairly treating both prosecutors and defense attorneys in cases before him. And you don't need to take my word for it. 19 Connecticut assistant state's attorneys are state prosecutors who have worked with or appeared before Judge Williams wrote to this committee in unanimous and strong support for his nomination to the District of Connecticut. They went on to say, quote, he is clear, cogent, and decisive. His findings are thoughtful and well-received. His decisions reflect his own evaluations and not those of the prosecution or defense. He is a highly gifted jurist, end quote. I agree, and I know Judge Williams' measured and insightful, incisive 
approach combined with his judicial experience will make him highly qualified to serve on the District of Connecticut. So in conclusion, I urge my, all my colleagues to support Ms. Degala and Judge Williams, and I look forward to their swift confirmation. With that, I will turn to the ranking member, Senator Grassley, for his opening remark. I'm sure I'm going to shock my Democrat colleagues when I speak very positively about each of these nominees, because often that's not the case. I'm going to start with General Hayton. I think the word mainstream is thrown around too often to describe judicial nominees who clearly hold activist judicial philosophies. It's a word that people use to cover up extremism. This is an unusual hearing in that General Hayton, I think, I see as a mainstream nominee. The best I can tell, he's exactly the kind of circuit judge I'd expect to be nominated by a Democrat president. He'd have been right at home under Obama or Clinton. In fact, in many ways, General Hayton reminds me of a Trump nominee. He graduated from a good law school, clerked on the Supreme Court. He has diverse experience ranging from private practice to academia to public service. And as Virginia's Solicitor General, he's advocated zealously on behalf of his clients, the Commonwealth of Virginia to defend the laws that the people of Virginia have enacted. I'm sure I won't agree with every opinion of uh, this nominee. Uh, as he writes, uh, if he is confirmed as a judge, I bet I don't agree with his politics, but I believe he could serve as a moderating force on the uh, Fourth Circuit, which is an activist court that's well outside the mainstream of federal appeals courts with a Democrat president in, the, uh, in a state with two Democrat colleagues who are here. I'm not sure that we could hope for anything better than a smart, experienced liberal with misfortune of extensive experience uh, before uh, the increasingly erratic Fourth Circuit. Ms. Giles and Judge Nakmanoff Nakman uh, also seem like well-qualified picks for their seats. Ms. Giles is a prosecutor of considerable renown, while Judge Nachmanoff um, was uh, previously the federal defender in his court. He has a judicial record that we can evaluate as a magistrate judge. This will help us see if he's a Bill of Rights judge, like uh, dozens of public defenders who recently came out in support of the Second Amendment before the Supreme Court or a criminal defense judge like this uh, administration, other picks. The same can be said for Connecticut, where Judge Williams is also a former public defender with a judicial record, and Ms. Nagala is a well-known prosecutor. Ms. Nagala has argued against some basic constitutional rights under the Second Amendment, though I'll probably want to ask her about that. Lastly, Mr. Dellinger, who's been nominated to run the Office of Legal Counsel. We had a good conversation and I'm uh, over the phone and I'm eager to learn more about his views of the Justice Department. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by the real chairman of the committee, Senator Durbin. Uh, thank you for joining us. Senator, if you have any opening remarks, we'd be glad to hear from you. Very briefly, I'm glad to be here on what is largely a Connecticut, Virginia day. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to allow the largely positive uh, statements by a senator uh, from Iowa deter me from my support of these nominees. I think they're a good indication of their quality, as are most of the nom if not all of the nominees from the Biden administration. And with your colleague you know, waiting for his turn and two former governors of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I'm going to close my remarks. Thanks, Senator Urban. Uh, we are joined by uh, two of our most esteemed colleagues and my great friend and uh, wonderful colleague from Connecticut who has worked with me in recommending nominees to the bench. Uh, I'm gonna call on them now and just for everybody attending, uh, 
we are very, very grateful that they are joining us. It's a very, very busy morning in the Senate, and each of them has taken time from other obligations to be here, and we thank you very much. I'll first uh, call on Senator Warner, who will introduce three of our nominees, Mr. Heightens, Ms. Giles, and Judge Nachmaninoff. Well, thank you. I I was actually going to call you Chair Blumenthal, but so much for that. Um, but uh, Senator Blumenthal, thank you. Chair Durbin, members of the committee, uh, Ranking Member Grassley. Um, I, I will say that uh, uh, to my friends who are coming before the committee, it is um, those were great words of praise from Ranking Member Grassley, so uh, uh, I, I appreciate his comments. Um, today it is um, my distinct honor to introduce three, mem three fellow Virginians, and they are all outstanding public servants. Mr. Toby Haytens, nominated to serve on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Ms. Patricia Tolliver Giles, nominated to serve as a U.S. District Court Judge for the Eastern District of Virginia, and Judge Michael Nachmanoff, also nominated to serve as a U.S. District Court Judge for the Eastern District. All three of these nominees, I think, have exemplary credentials. They have all demonstrated a commitment to public service and have strong and broad-based support from the legal, legal community. Toby is joined today by his spouse, Sarah, his sister, um, and his parents, Bill and Sally, uh, and his sister Heidi. Um, Toby currently serves as, a, as Senator Grassley indicated, as Solicitor General for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He earned his bachelor's degree from uh, Malchester College and went on to receive his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Toby began his legal career serving as a clerk for Chief Judge Edward Becker in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. He then clerked for the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Toby is dedicated to developing skills in young lawyers through both his extensive teaching and mentoring at UVA and has demonstrated an abiding commitment to diversity. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Patricia Tolliver Giles, nominated by President Biden to serve as U.S. District Court for the Judge for the Eastern District of Virginia. I'd like to welcome Patricia's son, Pierce, um, her mother, Ollie, siblings Felicia, Johnny, and Jonathan, and her niece, Lauren, who are both here and in the second row. Patricia is a native of the Commonwealth and a two-time graduate of UVA. Patricia Brandt began her legal career as a clerk for the Honorable Gerald Bruce Lee, both on the 19th Judicial Circuit of Virginia and in the U.S. District Court for the EDVA. Patricia served almost two decades in the Alexandria office of the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia and is currently the managing AUSA for the Alexandria office. She has also been active in Camp Kappa Street Law Program, a week-long camp for at-risk boys ages 10 to 16 that features a street law program designed to introduce the boys to a judge to law through a mock trial. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce Judge Michael Nachmanoff, who currently serves as a magistrate judge in the Eastern District. The judge is joined by his wife, Kiki, and two of his three daughters, Anna and Charlotte, and I understand his eldest daughter, Clara, is actually in California, but has promised to get up and at least be watching this online. Um, so I'm, I know she hopefully is turning, tuning in. The judge earned his bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University and attended law school at the University of Virginia. He clerked for the Honorable Leonie Brinkema in the Eastern District of Virginia. For 13 years, Judge Nachmanoff served as a federal public defender for the Eastern District. Since his appointment to the bench in 2015, the judges heard a wide range of cases on civil litigation matters and criminal matters, all while presiding over the Alexandria Reentry and Recovery Program, a weekly drug court program that provides treatment support for de defendants suffering from chronic substance abuse. Um, I will echo what uh, Senator Blumenthal, you have said, what uh, the distinguished uh, ranking member has said, uh, these are three um, nominees that Senator Kane and I wholeheartedly endorse. We think they bring the right experience, the right life experiences, and clearly broad-based support from the legal community, and I urge the committee's uh, rapid consideration of all three. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Warner. Uh, we'll now turn to Senator Kane, also of Virginia, for his remarks. 
thank you to the committee for having the hearing and pulling these great Virginia nominees together. It's great to be together with my colleague, Senator Warner. He and I were in law school together, and he always famously says, Tim became a lawyer, and I became a client. <laughs> um, and I am here to recommend heartily these three individuals because I practiced law heavily before these courts in the 17 years that I was in private practice. And they are excellent matches for these very unique and uh, courts. Uh, since Mark has done such a good job in describing the qualities of these nominees, let me just tell you a bit about the two courts, Eastern District, Virginia, and Fourth Circuit, and why they fit so well. The Eastern District of Virginia is an unusual court. Some of you know this uh, because of your service on this committee. It's called the Rocket Docket in the Eastern District of Virginia. It has traditionally now for decades had one of the fastest dockets of uh, any court from the filing of a case uh, to the end of a case. Um, and it, it is a tough thing to do for the judges and for the lawyers, uh, but the reason the EDVA has stuck with the rocket docket is it's the right thing to do for the parties who appear before the court. Uh, the court has had an understanding that it's, it's a painful thing to be a party in a criminal or civil matter. And one thing we ought to do is try to deliver you a decision in a reasonable period of time. EDVA also is unusual because it has a very high percentage of national security-related cases because of the uh, presence of both the Pentagon and the CIA and other agencies in the geographic jurisdiction. So these two district court nominees, Patricia Giles, who's been uh, kind of a pillar of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the EDVA, and Judge Michael Nachmanoff first as a public defender and as a magistrate judge, they understand the importance of this court and the unique traditions of it, they're well regarded by the judges and litigants who practice before the EDVA and their backgrounds speak for themselves, as Senator Warner indicated. The Fourth Circuit is also unusual. Um, I practice before the Fourth Circuit and they have a tradition that I don't know that any other circuit follows. And that is at the end of every argument, the Fourth Circuit judges come down off the bench and they file in front of the council table to shake the hands of every attorney that argues before it. And that's a tradition that also goes back a very long while and it's an effort by the Fourth Circuit, whatever the composition, whoever nominated the judges, to be a place of civility. Uh, Toby Haytens has a tremendous track record as an appellate advocate and an academic, but I think anyone who meets with Toby or, or sees him do his work will understand that he really exemplifies uh, a standard of civility which we should all aspire to, but certainly we need in our judicial nominees. And so I recommend all three without hesitation. I'm, pleased to be here with my senior senator to say these are some great Virginians and they'll be superb additions to the federal judiciary. Thanks, Senator Kane. Uh, I now turn to my colleague from Connecticut, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the ranking member, Chairman Durbin. Thank you for allowing uh, the three of us to appear before you. Uh, I think Senator Blumenthal did a, a very adequate job of explaining the merits of both of the candidates who are before this committee uh, today. And so I will just offer uh, brief uh, additional remarks. Um, these are uh, two nominees that have had um, very difficult jobs um, in their uh, respective roles in the state's criminal justice system. Uh, Judge Williams is relatively new to the Superior Court. He was nominated by uh, our governor in 2014, but um, in one of his recommendations, uh, a colleague described his meteoric rise uh, because only two years after his appointment to the state bench, he was uh, named the presiding judge over the criminal docket in Hartford. And while I don't know uh, the Connecticut uh, court system uh, as well as Senator Kane knows Virginia's federal court system, what I do know is that that's one of the busiest dockets in the entire state. Uh, he has handled it admirably. Thus, he is uh, recommended today uh, both by those who uh, appeared uh, on the prosecutor's side and the defense side. Um, but in his application, um, he, he talks a lot about um, the professional diversity uh, that he believes, that Judge Williams believes, makes him a better judge. Um, we have highlighted the fact that he spent time as a uh, public defender before coming to the bench, but he notes in his application that he also spent time as a service technician for a telephone company, a house painter, a waiter, and a TV rental agent. And all of those experiences, um, in his mind and in our mind, um, made him and make him uh, a better judge. 
Uh, Sarah Nagala um, is impressive in her own right, uh, a very difficult job as the deputy chief of the major crimes unit. Uh, she has this very specific focus on hate crimes and crimes relating to human trafficking and child exploitation. Difficult job to uh, get up and do and, and then uh, come home at night with. Um, but what I really think is important about her application is that she, in her role as a prosecutor, has understood that uh, in order to make the criminal justice system more effective, she had an obligation to extend herself um, beyond the prosecutor's office. And so she led this incredibly innovative partnership whereby uh, she trained with a team, 1,200 police officers in Connecticut on cultural competency. She went out and worked with the Anti-Defamation League to train uh, Connecticut educators on anti-Muslim and anti-Sikh bias and bullying. Um, she um, obviously has risen very quickly as a young prosecutor to the deputy chief of the Major Crimes Unit, just like Judge Williams. She has had a meteoric rise, but she has also found time um, to understand the importance of living in her community um, and building out uh, a support system for prosecutors um, in police departments and in our educational system. So uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to uh, associate myself with these two uh, nominees, um, uh, as well as the Virginia nominees. Uh, thank you for allowing us to say a few words today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Murphy. Uh, I'd like to turn to Senator Coons to introduce uh, Mr. Dellinger. Um, thank you, um, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, President Biden's nominee to be the Assistant Attorney General of the United States uh, for the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. Uh, Mr. Hampton Dellinger has been a friend since uh, we got to know each other in law school, uh, and I think he will serve our nation excellently in this position. Uh, as a committee, we are responsible for crafting policy, uh, empowering the Department of Justice to enforce the law, to ensure public safety, and to secure equal justice for all Americans. Uh, we also work to protect and maintain our judicial branch. Inside the Department of Justice, the Office of Legal Policy covers similar ground. The Office of Legal Policy develops and implements the department's strategic policy initiatives, coordinates between different elements of the department and other federal agencies, and advises the Attorney General on policy matters and candidates for judicial nominations. Uh, Hampton, Mr. Dellinger, forgive me, is an outstanding choice to lead the Office of Legal Policy in its mission. He has sterling qualifications, broad experience in legal practice and government, and is a uh, fiercely dedicated advocate for equal justice and civil rights. Mr. Dellinger's roots are in North Carolina. He grew up there, and after graduating uh, college from the University of Michigan and attending uh, the Yale Law School, Mr. Dellinger clerked uh, for Judge J. Dixon Phillips, uh, Jr. on the Fourth Circuit, uh, although he did briefly sojourn in a large Washington, D.C. firm, uh, Hampton decided to build his legal career in his home state of North Carolina. He returned there and dove into public service. He worked for the North Carolina Attorney General's Office as special counsel, ultimately rising to deputy attorney general. He later became chief legal counsel for the North Carolina governor. Um, there, Mr. Dellinger oversaw judicial nominations and helped identify talented, diverse candidates for the bench and helped markedly increase the number of women trial judges in the state, made gains in the number of black judges on the state bench, and appointed, helped support the appointment of the first Hispanic judge in the state's history, uh, then Judge Albert Diaz, later appointed to the Fourth Circuit by former President Obama. Uh, after his work in state government, Mr. Dellinger moved to private practice, and for the last 18 years, he's advised clients on complex issues and litigated cases in state and federal court. After nearly two decades as a partner with distinguished law firms, Mr. Dellinger recently opened his own law practice, and he has had, in my view, a broad and balanced private practice career and made a significant dedication of his time to pro bono representations. Hampton has a professional reputation as an inclusive bridge builder. I know him to be a humble and generous person with a great heart, a loving father to his two children, husband to his wife, Jolyn, and a good friend. In his public service and as a practicing attorney, Hampton Dellinger has a demonstrated track record of advocating for social justice and racial and gender equality. Um, the committee has received many letters in support of his nomination from business owners, faith leaders, current and former federal and state law enforcement officials, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and attorneys supporting tribal sovereignty, and others, including the North Carolina State Conference for the NAACP. Um, I urge my colleagues to support his nomination and his swift confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to offer this introduction. Thanks, Senator Coons. Uh, our custom is to begin with the appellate. 
court nominee, and uh, that is Mr. Heightens, and then we'll have the second panel with the district court nominees and Ms. Dellinger. So if Mr. Heighton would please come forward. And our custom is also to swear in all the witnesses, so let me administer the oath to you. Do you swear that the testimony that you'll give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. You may proceed with any opening remarks that you may have, Mr. Hyden. Good morning, uh, and thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for scheduling this hearing, for, to Senator Blumenthal uh, for chairing it, uh, and to the President for nominating me. I'd also like to particularly thank my home state senators, Senators Warner and Kane, first for recommending me to the President and for their warm introductions this morning. I'd like to take a chance to introduce the members of my family who are here with me today and to acknowledge just a few people uh, who could not be. Um, my parents, Bill and Sally, and my sister Heidi, all traveled here from their and my hometown of Superior, Wisconsin, and I am very grateful to them for that. Uh, my brother, Troy, and his family, I know, are watching from their home in Metairie, Louisiana, and I'm looking forward to seeing them in just a few days in our mutual hometown of Superior, Wisconsin. Last but not least, I need to thank my spouse, Sarah Sautel, for more things than I could possibly go into uh, in the short time I have this morning. I'd like to close by acknowledging two extraordinary people who I very much wish could have been here today, uh, the late Edward R. Becker and the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They were the first two federal judges that I ever knew personally, and they were two of the finest human beings that I have ever met. I am honored and humbled by this nomination, and I look forward very much to answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll now have a round of five-minute questions, and I'll begin. Uh, let me start where you just finished with the two judges, particularly Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You have a, an extraordinary background, very, very impressive, not only clerking, but obviously as a distinguished academic and accomplished litigator, having argued 10 cases before the United States Supreme Court and having served most recently as Virginia's Solicitor General. What lessons do you take from your knowledge, your personal knowledge and your experience with federal judges the ones you've known and the ones before whom you have litigated. Thank you for that question, Senator Blumenthal. I, I have learned an extraordinary amount um, pretty much from every federal judge that I've had the extraordinary fortune to have ever gotten to know. Um, and I actually think that the biggest things I would take away from the two judges for whom I clerked, um, who were appointed by presidents of different political parties, but I think the things that I learned, the biggest things I learned from the two were the same. Um, you know, the first is to take and the importance of taking every case at a time and very seriously. You know, when I clerked for them, Judge Becker had been a judge longer than I had been alive, and Justice Ginsburg was getting very close to having been a judge for longer than I had been alive. And they both worked extraordinarily hard on every single case because I think they recognized that for the parties, that case is their one case, perhaps, before the courts. And it is vitally important that judges treat every case and every litigant with respect. I think another thing I learned from both of them um, is the importance of separating people and ideas or separating legal disagreements with personal uh, dislike, I guess I'd say. Uh, much has rightly been made of Justice Ginsburg's decade-long close personal friendship with her great friend, the late Antonin Scalia. And Judge Becker, as far as I can tell, knew every single person in the city of Philadelphia, which was a city that he had grown up in and spent his entire career both before and after becoming a judge. And so I think you know, judges have a very important job and a very important role, but they're people. Um, and it's vitally important to remember that and to treat everyone you encounter with civility and respect. Uh, one other question. Uh, as frequently happens here, many of our nominees have past associations. They belong to various groups over the course of their careers, and I think Another one of the lessons from both of those judges' careers is that they 
put aside their personal views, their political perspectives, would you anticipate doing the same? Absolutely, Senator Blumenthal. Um, as you mentioned, and, and some others have mentioned, the very first job I had out of law school was as a law clerk to a federal judge. And the second job I had was while working at the Department of Justice. So my very first two jobs out of law school were one as an assistant to a person whose job was to apply the law, and the other was as an advocate on behalf of people who were advocating on behalf of their client. That was the federal government. Um, the role of advocate and the role of judge are incredibly important, but they are different roles. In fact, our system depends on the notion they are different roles. The job of an advocate is to make the best case he or she can on behalf of their client. And the job of a judge is to listen to the arguments, analyze the record, and apply the law to reach a correct outcome. And I'm absolutely committed to doing that if I were fortunate enough to be confirmed. Thank you very much. I'll turn to the ranking member. Yeah. Congratulations on your nomination. Uh, before I get to questions, I wanted to talk about Justice Thomas writing a touching tribute to his former colleague and your former boss, Justice Ginsburg. This is what Judge Thomas said, Justice Ginsburg and I often disagreed, but at no time during our long tenure together were we disagreeable with each other. She placed a tremendous premium on civility and respect. This approach did not lessen her strong convictions, but rather facilitated a respectful environment in which disputes furthered our common enterprise of judging. Whether in agreement or disagreement, exchanges with her invariably sharpened our final work product. I noticed that uh, like Judge Justice Ginsburg, you seem to have a capacity to work with, debate, and learn from people you probably disagree with. You wrote letters supporting the nominations of Judge Thapar and uh, Judge uh, Strauss, both of whom were President Trump's uh, Supreme Court shortlist. In your legal publications, you have thanked conservatives like Paul Clement, Judge uh, Naomi Rao, uh, for helping with your scholarship. You've spoken at the Federalist Society event. Has working with people that you may disagree with sharpened your legal arguments? Has it made you a better lawyer? Absolutely, Senator Grassley. It seems to me that you probably worked with many originalists in your years as a lawyer. Do you know any originalists who might want to overturn Brown versus Board of Education? Senator Grassley, I, I certainly suspect that I have worked with people who would identify themselves as originalists. Um, I don't feel it's my place to say whether someone else would identify themselves a particular way uh, or not. Um, I, I guess I would say I've met very few people in my life who have expressed interest in overturning Brad versus Board of Education. Thank you for that answer. <clears throat> my last set of questions. You spent the last three years or so as Solicitor General in that role. You've argued a number of views that I'm sure myself and many of my colleagues might disagree with. I'm sure you're aware that many of President Trump's judicial nominees had also served as state solicitor general, like Kyle Duncan, Britt Grant, Andrew Brasher, and Eric Murphy, just to name a few. Is it fair to say that you have many arguments you may or may not agree uh, personally with that you've had to make before the courts? Thank you for that question, Senator Grassley. Um, I have spent a long time litigating both on behalf of the federal government, on behalf of the state government, and in private practice. Um, I, I take my obligations, uh, my ethical obligations as a lawyer very seriously, so I don't think I'm permitted to identify uh, any cases where I did or did not personally agree with an argument that my client was making. I, I think I can say without violating my obligations that there may have been cases that uh, did or did not better or worse align with my own personal views, but that's because that's not the role of an advocate. The role of an advocate is to represent their client and make arguments on behalf of their client. I think you just answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Aren't you duty-bound to zealously advocate on behalf of Virginia's interests as Solicitor General? Absolutely, Senator Grassley. Can you describe the differences in roles between being a judge and being a state solicitor general. That's my last question. 
Of course, Senator Grassley. Um, I, I think the roles are complementary in the sense that both the role of advocate and the role of judge are necessary to make our system work the way it is supposed to. Uh, but they are different, fundamentally different roles. The role of an advocate, whether for the state government, whether for the federal government or for a private party, is to advocate on behalf of their client. The role of a judge is to apply the law and reach the correct outcome in a particular case. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Chairman Blumenthal. Thank you for being here, Ms. Heidens. I appreciate it. I, I noticed here when we asked you of all the cases that you've been involved in to pick your 10 that were the most uh, significant uh, litigated matters in which you personally were involved, that on the list of 10 were two or three pretty hot political topics. The removal of the Robert E. Lee statue in, in Richmond, the D.C. sniper case, a COVID-19 case involving Gold's Gym franchises, and a couple which were more obscure, like uranium mining in Virginia, which I don't know much about. <clears throat> I'm really trying to put this into perspective of your experience uh, in that role of advocating in those cases and the controversy that is, might have been associated with them and the impact it had on your experience, your judgment, even your personal relationship with people in the community. I'm sorry, uh, I realized my mic was off. Um, as you mentioned, I have been involved in, in several uh, very high profile matters, particularly in the last few years uh, in my role as an advocate for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, you know, those cases all raised interesting and difficult challenges. Uh, the, the Malvo versus Mathena case you mentioned, um, obviously it was something that had been going on for a very long time before I started representing the Commonwealth of Virginia in that case, I became involved uh, only at the U.S. Supreme Court phase after, actually, it turns out, a decision of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit uh, in that case. Um, the Lee Monument litigation was very different. Um, I was involved in that case basically from the moment that it was filed. Um, I remember getting the phone call about the litigation having been filed. And the reason that case, I think, is so significant um, is it's one of, if not the only case I've ever been involved in literally from beginning to end, from the moment... Um, from the moment there was a request for a temporary injunction through the trial on the merits, through post-trial proceedings, and all the way to the state Supreme Court. Um, and then some of the other cases you mentioned. I mean, it, it has been an extraordinary... So let me dwell on the Lee Monument case for a moment, because the point I'm trying to get to is what kind of outside influence slash pressure did you feel in the responsibility that you had for the Commonwealth? In Pressure, I guess I would say, in the sense of one of the things that's so significant about government service is the knowledge that you're never just representing an individual in the way that you sometimes are in private practice. You are representing the, the Commonwealth as a whole. You're representing the governor. You're representing the elected officials, the General Assembly of Virginia. I think that's one of the things that makes public service so thrilling, but it, but it also can make it a little scary sometimes as you realize this is a, this is a big responsibility. Um, I, I wouldn't say pressure. So I'd say pressure in the sense of a felt obligation, you really need to do very well. This is an important case. A lot of people are paying attention to it. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, litigation is litigation, and you do the absolute best you can um, and hope for the best result you can for your client. And your relationship with opposing counsel after? Uh, very, very, I would say very positive, Senator. One of the great thrills of my life, um, I remember one of the cases that I did that, that's mentioned on my form was actually an oral argument against my old boss, Paul Clement, who was representing uh, the other side in, this is the, the, the Bethune Hill litigation. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he was obviously someone I had known before and since then. Um, but I've also gotten to know opposing counsel in a number of these cases. And, and I, I have worked as hard as I can to treat my opposing counsel with respect to separate the personal and the legal. Um, and I believe I've had a po very positive relationship with my opposing counsel in all of my cases. Thanks for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Durbin. Senator Kennedy. Uh, Professor, you're on leave from the faculty at Virginia Law, are you not? I am, Senator. Yeah. Um, one of your colleagues, Professor 
Paul Stephen tells me you are a rock star. That, that is very kind of him to say that, Senator. Uh, Professor Stephen is a, is a, a wonderful person. <laughs> he, uh, I went to law school with him. He may be the smartest guy I've ever met. He, uh, he deserves to be on the federal bench, frankly. Um, I've been listening to you carefully. You don't sound to me like you're much of a politician. I like that. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I, I, I'm going to stipulate up front, Professor. You're going to follow precedent. Uh, and I know you've been coached. I'm not blaming the Biden White House. The Trump White House did it to, you know, coach all of our nominees to just say we're going to follow precedent. I think you'll follow precedent anyway. But but I'm not going to ask you to, to uh, tell me how you decide a case. That would be unethical. Might be illegal, but it would be unethical. But I didn't want to know how you think. Let's take a new right. Let's, let's, uh, I'm not going to try to talk to you about the relationship between a fundamental right and a suspect classification because you'll beat me on that one. But, but, but we both know that they both used to create new rights. Let's take wealth, wealth as a suspect classification. Do, do you think heightening the scrutiny of wealth as a social economic policy, socioeconomic policy, is a decision for the voters through their le legislative body or the courts? Senator Kennedy, I believe the Supreme Court has already confronted the question of whether wealth is a suspect class. I know. And, and, and that they Rodriguez, concluded... Yes, but they could... Once again, I'm not talking about... I know they said no, and, but... I'm just asking, as a, asking you to put your law professor hat on. Well, I guess, Senator Kennedy, I think that the Supreme Court, in deciding Rodriguez, um, has essentially said that it is a matter for the legislature, not a matter for the courts. And if I were confirmed as a lower court judge, I would follow that guidance from the Supreme Court. Okay. We know you've probably taught it. We know that the right to use contraceptives is a penumbra of the, let's see, you correct me if I'm wrong, first, third, fourth, fifth amendments to the Constitution. Now, you don't find the words right to use contraceptives in the Constitution. And I personally think people ought to have the right to use a conversation, <laughs> by the way. But uh, we know that that right was found as a penumbra of those amendments in Griswold v. Connecticut. But we can't see it in the Constitution. Is that a pretty fair statement? Senator Kennedy, I, I would agree that the word contraception is not in the Constitution. And like you, my understanding is that the Supreme Court decision that recognizes that right is Griswold versus Connecticut. Yes. Okay. Are there other penumbras that we can't see? Senator Kennedy, I'm not aware of any Supreme Court decision other than Griswold that used the specific word penumbra. I Do think you think there are other penumbras out there, lurking out there, that we can't see? Senator Kennedy, I'm not sure that I think there are other penumbras out there that we can't see because, as I think I've said, I think the only time the Supreme Court has ever used that specific word is in Griswold versus Connecticut. The Supreme Court has, for at least 130 years, concluded that, this, that the Constitution protects certain rights, such as the right to marriage, the right to travel, um, the right to raise children that are not expressly set out in the text of the Constitution. Professor, I, I don't really care about your politics. Um, I, I care about your intellect, which is like, pretty well established. I, I care about your analytical abilities. I care about your integrity. And I care about your understanding of the role of the judiciary. And um, some of the nominees that have appeared before us, I believe, see it as their 
see their role as a federal judge to try to rewrite the Constitution and or our statutes every other Thursday to advance a social agenda that they can't get by the voters through their elected representatives. And I don't agree with that. Um, I, I don't get the impression that you're like that. I'll give you the last word. Well, thank you for that, Senator Kennedy. I think the role of a judge is very important, but I think it is a limited one. Um, I think it is the, uh, the, I do not think it, I think it is the role, of, the judge has the important role to apply the law to the facts before him or her in the cases that come before them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. Uh, I see no additional colleagues on our committee to pose questions to you, Mr. Heighton, so thank you very much for joining us. We're honored to have you. And I will now call the next panel, which are the district court nominees and Mr. Dellinger. Uh, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear that the testimony you will give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, we will ask you uh, if you have any remarks, opening remarks. Uh, we'll go down the panel and uh, ask each of you to give them. Ms. Giles. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking you, Senator Blumenthal, for presiding today. I would also like to thank Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for setting this hearing and all the members of the Judiciary Committee for considering my nomination. I would also like to thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination and Senator Warner and Kane for recommending me to the President for their trust and confidence that they've placed in me and their kind words of introduction for me today. This is truly the honor of my professional life. And I thank the Lord for this day, for the grace that he has shown me over the years and for how far he has brought me in my life. I would also like to thank this, uh, take this opportunity to introduce and thank my family who's attending with me today, starting with my mother, Ali Tolliver, who was a daughter of a sheriff proper, born and raised in rural Mississippi, and for me, my mother is the personification of strength, faith, love, and wisdom, and she has always been and will always be my North Star. I'd like to acknowledge my three siblings, Felicia, Johnny Jr., and Jonathan, and my niece, Lauren, who have supported me my entire life. And finally, but certainly not least, my son, Pierce, who is my inspiration and has done a great job taking care of me <laughs> over the years. I would also like to acknowledge two people who aren't with me today uh, physically, but who I carry with me in my heart each and every day of my life. And that is my beloved husband, Gene, who is my best friend, and my father, Johnny Tolliver. And I know that they are both smiling in heaven today. I would also like to thank my extended family of nieces, nephews, in-laws, my aunts, uncles, and cousins my friends, my mentors over the years, my church family, my colleague in the U.S. Attorney's Office and members of the Defense Bar, and the entire court family at the Alexandria Division who have supported me over the years. And I'd especially like to thank Judge Gerald Bruce Lee for giving me the honor of being his first federal law clerk and for launching my uh, legal career. And with that, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Giles. Mr. Nakamura. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for scheduling this hearing today, <clears throat> Senator Blumenthal for chairing the hearing and the entire committee for considering my nomination. I'm very grateful to Senators Warner and Kane for recommending me to the President and for their kind introductions this morning. I'd like to express my deep gratitude to President Biden for nominating me. I would not be here today without the unwavering love and support of my family. My father's distinguished career in government 
which includes service in the Navy, Treasury and State Departments, and on the National Security Council, has been a model for me as I pursued my own career in public service. He's watching from home today, and I want to thank him for his love and all that he has done for our family and this country. My mother is no longer with us, but her joyful spirit lives on in me and all of those who are the beneficiaries of her boundless energy and love. My brothers, David and Jeffrey, have always been an inspiration to me, and I'm grateful for their support and that of my wonderful extended family. My wife, Kiki, and daughters, Anna and Charlotte, are here with me today. My oldest daughter, Clara, is watching from California. I'm enormously proud of my children, and I owe a debt of gratitude to Kiki that can never be repaid for all the sacrifices she has made on my behalf. In addition to my family, I'm fortunate to have had numerous mentors, and I want to thank two in particular. The Honorable Laney M. Brinkema, for whom I clerked, and the late Frank Dunham, my law partner and the first federal defender in this district. I'm eternally grateful for all they taught me about integrity and justice. Thanks to my many colleagues and opposing counsel, all of whom I consider friends, especially my courthouse family who have been so supportive of me throughout this process. Finally, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary work of my chamber staff, Gul Garbia and Brittany Hacker. They have both provided me with invaluable assistance. It is a tremendous honor to have been nominated, and if confirmed, it will be a privilege to continue my public service as a United States District Judge. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. Degala. Good morning. I'd like to thank Senator Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley and all the senators on this committee for allowing me to appear today. I'm also deeply appreciative to President Biden for the great honor of this nomination and to Senators Blumenthal and Murphy and their staff members for their support in this process and for the kind introductions today. I'm here today with my parents, Drs. Roop and Vani Nagala, who have been my greatest role models. They have truly lived the American dream. They emigrated to the United States from India and have lived in North Dakota, where my three siblings and I were born and raised for more than 40 years. They dedicated their lives to providing medical care to rural North Dakotans, and they taught me the importance of public service. Every opportunity that I have been given in my life was set in motion by my parents' hard work, sacrifice, and love. I'm also grateful to my sister, Sonia, who is here today, and to my brothers, Jay and Vic, who are watching from home. I'm lucky to be their sister. I also have with me today my brilliant husband and true partner, Alexander Rosas, who has been an unending source of love, support, and friendship since we met on the first day of law school so many years ago. Alexander is an amazing dad to our two young boys, Andrew, who is three, and Anand, who is two. We are grateful to my parents-in-law, Alan and Christina Rosas, for their support and for traveling from Michigan to Connecticut to watch the boys while we are here today. I'm also grateful for the support of my siblings-in-law, Wayne, Susan, Kyle, and Anna. Finally, I would like to thank my family, friends, colleagues, and defense counsel watching around the world and around the country. With special gratitude to my many mentors, including Judge Susan Graber, for whom I clerked and whose passion for the law is unbridled, and to my wonderful colleagues at the United States Attorney's Office in Connecticut, who serve the United States with honor every single day. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Judge Williams. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for chairing today's meeting and for your incredibly kind remarks. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and esteemed members of this distinguished committee, thank you all for having me here today. Thank you to President Biden for this humbling nomination and to Senators Blumenthal and Murphy for supporting my application. I'm here because of them and because of my mother, Lupita, who grew up in poverty in rural Texas, worked the fields, and lost her parents at an early age. My father, Geraldo, who grew up in Panama, a descendant of those who built the canal. His father worked for the government when people of color automatically earned a lower wage. My parents were retired after successful careers in education and in business, and they instilled in my amazing sister, Nadia, and in me, a focus on academics, hard work, faith, and service to others. My wife, Andrea, was raised similarly. She's a hardworking managing attorney, an invested mother, wife, and daughter. She is the rock of our family, showing loving patience in the pandemic and keeping our spirits up. Throughout this process, she has excelled at work, 
and managed our household so that I could work late. Thank you. Together we're raising children, Harrison and Grace, who are kind, determined, and resilient. I'm here because of them, because of my coworkers, and because of my mentors who believed in me and who encouraged me to apply. Justice Luby Harper and former Chief Justice Chase Rogers of our state Supreme Court have led me by example and with candor. If I am fortunate enough to be confirmed, I promise you that I will adhere to the law as it's written and that I will work hard every single day to become worthy of your faith in me. I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Dellinger. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and Senators of the Judiciary Committee, including my home state Senator from North Carolina, Senator Tillis. I am honored to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to be the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy. And thank you, Senator Coons, for your generous introduction and for being so nice to me when we were young. I'm thankful to be joined here today by my daughter, Austin Dellinger, and Chairman Durbin, I want you to know she's about to enter her senior year at the University of Chicago. Uh, we expect her to graduate <laughs> and then be a free agent for a uh, permanent home. So Illinois is very much in the running. And I appreciate the love and support of family who cannot be present, including my son, Jackson, and a quartet of professors who have taught me so much in tuition free. My amazing wife of almost 27 years, Professor JoLynn Childers Dellinger. My father, Professor Walter Dellinger, who has done so much for the law inside and outside of the classroom. My wonderful, always younger brother, the one with the PhD, Dr. Drew Dellinger. And finally, I'd like to remember my mother, Professor Ann Maxwell Dellinger, who passed away recently. She was a blessing to me and always will be my moral compass. North Carolina is home to so many who have strengthened our country, and I'm grateful that my life has been touched by several of them. After law school, I clerked for James Dixon Phillips Jr., who was awarded a Bronze Star and Purple Heart for his heroism in World War II, before going on to a distinguished career as Dean of the UNC Law School and a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. I was also privileged to know Dr. John Hope Franklin, the celebrated historian whose groundbreaking book, From Slavery to Freedom, A History of African Americans, helped propel the civil rights movement, creating the more just state and nation I was blessed to grow up in. If confirmed, I believe my nearly 30-year career as an attorney in the public and private sectors has prepared me to succeed as the head of the Office of Legal Policy. I will draw upon my experience as North Carolina's Deputy Attorney General and as Chief Legal Counsel for the Governor's Office, in addition to my longtime work as a litigator. Litigators are officers of the court with an ethical duty to know and acknowledge binding law and operative facts. Recognition of the law's boundaries, coupled with a rigorous empirical approach to the facts, are, in my opinion, prerequisites to developing sound legal policies. Necessary, too, is an inclusive approach that seeks common ground and consensus. Beyond serving as a primary policy advisor to DOJ leadership, OLP coordinates rulemaking for the department and assists with the vetting of potential judicial nominees. I am committed to focusing on the facts and adhering to the rule of law across the office's entire portfolio. I believe the wide range of clients and viewpoints I have represented as well as the strong working relationships I have had with elected, appointed, and nonpartisan career officials will serve me well as I undertake to solicit and synthesize the views of diverse stakeholders. I am humbled to have been nominated to lead the Office of Legal Policy, and if confirmed, it will be a privilege to join a department of such dedicated, talented public servants who so expertly and consistently carry out its mission of ensuring the fair and impartial administration of justice for all Americans. I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thanks very much, Mr. Dellinger. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned your folks. I'm a big fan and admirer of them and proud to count myself as a friend of your dad's. Uh, today has very much a personal feeling for me. It feels very personal. Uh, your stories are so striking and moving. 
your families really have lived the American dream, as Ms. Nagala said about hers. And I think you represent the best of America. You will be the voice and face of justice on the bench. Having litigated in district courts as well as appellate courts in the country, I know, as you do, that very often you will be the end point for people who seek justice and fairness. A lot of folks simply can't go to the next level or don't feel that the strength of their case warrants it. But you will be that face and voice of justice. And so in my view, nothing the United States Senate does is more important than our advice and consent on our future judges. So I would like to ask each of you whether you feel that you can put aside whatever the pressures and other kinds of intrusions of the day are, and there are many because each of you has family that are supportive, and put aside your past experiences and views, your political perspectives to focus on the person or the group in front of you seeking justice. Um, and I'll begin with you, uh, Ms. Giles. Thank you for that question, Senator. I agree with you. I think that judges have the largest role in our judicial system because they have the most impact on the fair administration of justice and whether or not parties perceive whether or not they have received justice. When judges approach the case, they need to approach them with an open mind, unbiased, unswayed by any personal opinions and belief. Your litigants are demanding that. They are expecting that. They are owed that. And if I am honored to be confirmed, I will do that. Mr. Nakmana. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the past six years uh, serving as a magistrate judge, I've tried my best uh, to impartially and fairly give everyone a chance to be heard, to look at the facts on the record, and to apply the law fairly and, and evenly. Uh, and although uh, my experience in private practice and as a federal defender uh, has helped me and prepared me to become a judge, um, uh, my past is of no moment in addressing each of the cases that I have. Uh, those cases are decided solely uh, on the circumstances and the facts before me. And what I've really learned in those six years is that Every case is the most important case to the litigants before me, whether it is a speeding ticket on the GW Parkway uh, or a multi-million dollar patent case. Uh, for those individuals, uh, that is their most important day in court, and I've tried to be respectful uh, and do my job to the best of my ability and faithfully apply the law. Thank you, and I apologize. I should have addressed you as Judge Nakmanov. Thank you. No, no need to apologize. Ms. Nagla. Senator, uh, for the better part of a decade I've had the wonderful privilege of representing the United States in federal court as an assistant U.S. attorney, but I truly take to heart that the role of an advocate is different from that of the role of the judge. As a judge, as a prosecutor, I've had the opportunity to appear before a number of judges in our district who are faithful to the rule of law, who treat all the people who appear before them with dignity and respect, and I would be very honored to join in that tradition if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed. Judge William. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, I've also had the great fortune of um, having been able to show my ability to do this from the bench in state court over the past seven years. And frankly, it's been quite liberating. Um, in some ways, as an advocate, you know the stakes of uh, being unsuccessful in court uh, as to your client. Uh, and you know the times that uh, you might not have uh, done what you're asking a judge to do, although legal. As a judge, um, you're able to focus on the rule of law and the facts and circumstances in front of you and do what you believe is right. I'm certainly able to do that. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. I have a separate question, Mr. Dellinger, for you. I think um, that one of the challenges facing Attorney General Garland and his team has been to restore the credibility and luster, and I do view it as a tradition of great 
professional luster of our Department of Justice. Having served as U.S. Attorney, I think its credibility and independence are important beyond almost any other quality. Uh, and I think that he and his team have begun that effort very, very diligently and well. Uh, how do you see your role as providing support for that effort? Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. And, and I agree in your assessment of the current leadership of the Justice Department. I have the highest regard for General Garland, for the Deputy Attorney General, Lisa Monaco, for the Associate Attorney General, and for the institution itself. I was taught constitutional law by Burke Marshall at the Yale Law School, who served as head of the Civil Rights Division during the Kennedy administration in the Justice Department. And, and I thought of him as a hero. Both my parents have had the pleasure of serving uh, within the Justice Department, my mom with the FBI. I, I think the, um, it is fundamental that the Justice Department be independent and that integrity be at the forefront of everything that is done. It is, um, it, there are tens of thousands of career employees, uh, personnel at the Justice Department day in and day out who are incredibly uh, dedicated, who are incredibly talented, and um, it would be an honor to work with them. General Garland has made clear that there will be no politics, no partisanship at the Justice Department. I completely support that. I have had that experience at the state level working in a law enforcement organization, the North Carolina Attorney General's Office. You have to follow the law. You have to acknowledge the facts. You have to be able to work with nonpartisan um, personnel, with members of both parties, as I did as uh, Deputy Attorney General, working with uh, U.S. attorneys in the Bush administration, in the Clinton administration. And so I'm very comfortable with the mandate that General Garland has set down. And I hope to have, I, I hope to have the opportunity to serve with him. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your answers. I turn to the ranking member, Senator thank Grassley. You. Just to explain why I wasn't here to hear your testimony is because I was down the hall to finance committee asking questions. So I'm going to start with Judge uh, Miss Giles. Uh, you know the Eastern District well, uh, working for Judge Lee and being a seasoned in, in litigator there. So I want to congratulate you on your nomination. I'm interested in understanding the approach that you would take to reading the law as a district judge, especially in the areas of statutory rights and constitutional rights. Would you please explain for us what judicial philosophy would guide you in deciding statutory or constitutional issues? Yes, thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, when uh, I've never been a judicial officer, so I don't approach the bench with a, a set philosophy. I will say that my belief about the role that a judge should serve is uh, created by my experience as a litigator, both as a criminal litigator and a civil litigator. And I believe that judges should approach uh, uh, the interpretation of a law, the law in a fair and unbiased manner, not approaching it with an end result in mind or uh, with any type of bias, but simply to research the binding Supreme Court and uh, Fourth Circuit precedent for my case, or uh, in my situation, and then just uh, fairly applying the law to the facts. Thank you. Uh, to Ms. Nagala, uh, prior to becoming Assistant U.S. Attorney, you were an associate at a law firm where you helped write an amicus brief that advocated for the removal of handguns from American homes in the community in 2010. So I have two questions in regard to that. Do you believe that the Second Amendment protects the rights of Americans to own and keep handguns in their house? Yes, Senator, that is the holding of the Supreme Court in Heller. Okay. Do you stand by the view set forth in the amicus brief today? Senator, that brief was written in my very few weeks as a junior associate as a, at the law firm. The firm had already brought on the clients and the position that the clients wanted to take in the amicus brief. Um, I would follow the law of the Supreme Court in Heller and McDonald if I were lucky enough to be confirmed for this position. To, Mr., uh, to Judge Nachmanoff, uh, in your Senate Judiciary qu Questionnaire, you briefly mentioned that you spent a period of time serving as, as a crimes and misdemeanor prosecutor for Herndon, Virginia. 
So two questions in regard to that. Could you tell us a little more about your time as prosecutor? And B, uh, how do you think your experience as both a prosecutor and a public defender has affected your, your role as a judge? Thank you for that question, Senator Grassley. Uh, I would be delighted to, to address that. Uh, one of the clients of, of my law firm when I was in private practice for six years was the town of Herndon. And in Virginia, uh, towns and municipalities can contract out their prosecutorial functions for misdemeanors. And so I, along with my uh, partner, would uh, regularly go to the town of Herndon and prosecute the misdemeanor dockets. It was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I valued it greatly. I had served uh, as a paralegal in the Department of Justice before law school, and so uh, I, I, I found prosecution work rewarding. Uh, it also informed my work as a defense attorney in private practice uh, and as a public defender. I'm a great believer that some of the best defense attorneys have been prosecutors, and some of the best prosecutors have had the experience of representing individual clients uh, as criminal defense attorneys. Uh, all of those experiences uh, contributed to the work that I've done for the past six years as a magistrate judge uh, in helping me understand the lawyers who come before me and the challenges they face both on the prosecution side and on the defense side. Okay, my last question will have to be also to you. Uh, you've extensively, <clears throat> pardon me, you have extensively advocated for the repeal of mandatory minimums during your career as a federal public defender. If confirmed, you will be responsible for imposing mandatory minimums. Uh, if the crime fits the criteria, are you capable of imposing such sentences, given your strong advocacy against mandatory minimums? Thank you, Senator. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I will be able to impose mandatory minimums where appropriate. Uh, and in fact, over the past six years, some of my responsibilities have included the imposition of sentences that include mandatory minimums, magistrate judges, cannot sentence in felony cases, but misdemeanor cases that assimilate state law often have mandatory minimums, and I have imposed those sentences consistent with the law, and if fortunate enough to be confirmed, I would certainly do so and follow the law as a district judge. Thank you all for your answers. I yield. Senator Blumenthal had to step out for a minute and has informed us that Senator Durbin is next, followed by Senator Kennedy. He will be back shortly. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Ms. Giles, how old is Pierce Giles? Got to turn your mic on. Sorry about that. He's 12. He looks a lot older with that suit and tie on. <laughs> I, I, I really noticed how proud he was of his mom. Thank you. And your mom, what a story. Yes. I'm glad she's here today to see this moment in your life. I'm sure I'm... it means a lot to her. It certainly does to us. You are quite a litigator. Many people who call themselves trial attorneys never get close to a trial. You've amassed significant trial experience, 22 cases of verdict and chief counsel in 17 of those cases. <clears throat> that doesn't hurt when you're seeking a district court judgeship that may put you in a trial court room with regularity. So have you worked primarily on the criminal side? I, the last 18 years have been on the criminal side. Prior to that, I spent two and a half years at a large law firm doing general commercial litigation. And prior to that, I spent two years clerking on the district court in the Eastern District of Virginia. Great background. Judge Nakmanov, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Great. Federal Public Defender for the Eastern District of Virginia, you were responsible for supervising the office's general strategy of challenging sentencing disparities between crack and powder cocaine. And in the 2007 Supreme Court case, Kimbrough versus the United States, you successfully argued that a district judge had the discretion to impose a lower sentence than one recommended by the sentencing guidelines for a crack cocaine offense. Uh, we have been active in this committee on the issue of sentencing, hoping that we can undo some of the harm from some earlier decisions by Congress. Senator Grassley had to step away again, but he and I uh, worked with Senator Whitehouse and Senator Cornyn and others uh, to bring the first step back to uh, the President uh, Trump for his signature. I'd like to ask you, based on your experiencing, experience, how the crack powder sentencing disparity impacted your work as a federal public defender. Uh, thank you, Chairman Durbin. Uh, I had the privilege of arguing the Kimbrough case about the 
100 to 1 uh, crack powder disparity in the Supreme Court. Uh, and following uh, that decision, of course, the Sentencing Commission uh, retroactively lowered sentences for some defendants who had been uh, already sentenced for crack cocaine. And then, of course, uh, this body and through your leadership, uh, the Fair Sentencing Act was passed and then the First Step Act was passed. As federal defender, uh, we handled hundreds of those cases uh, involving retroactivity and sought to seek lower uh, sentences uh, for defendants who had been sentenced very harshly. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, many of those individuals were uh, released a little bit earlier than they otherwise would have been in my role. Of course, as a magistrate judge, uh, I have uh, played a different role uh, and not been involved in that issue. It's interesting. The law that created this disparity was bipartisan, passed Congress. Many of us voted for it to our regret today, but did. And when it came to changing it, that also was bipartisan, left, right, and center, Democrat, Republican, business, and other interests came together with the understanding that we had not done the job properly and a lot of lives were compromised. I thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Ms. Nagala, you received an award for a case involving a Romanian. It sounds like uh, it was a complicated case. Could you tell us a bit about it? Certainly, Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, the case involved the extradition of a number of Romanian citizens who were responsible for sending emails to average people, uh, essentially asking them to click on a link and input their banking information. These are typically known as phishing emails. Uh, many of us uh, probably have seen them uh, and hopefully not fallen victim to them. But from afar, these individuals were engaged in sending those emails, collecting the bank information, and then victimizing a number of people in Connecticut and throughout the United States. And you ex had them extradited to the United States? That's correct, your Senator Durbin. In an 80-month sentence? Correct, Senator. So, and received an award for your effort, oh, I'm sure, with your team. So I just want to note that for the record. I thank the other two nominees. I'm, I'm sorry that I've run out of time, but thank you. Uh, I say to you, uh, Judge Williams, that uh, you've been found well qualified by the American Bar Association, and I know you'll be in addition to the federal bench. Mr. Dellinger, great family tradition continues. Thank you. With my uh, apologies to Senator Kennedy for misstating the order, we recognize Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to all the nominees. Thanks for being here. Mr. Dellinger, I'd like to start with you, if I could. The office that you are being nominated for, Office of Legal Policy, is a very important one, obviously, at the Department of Justice, one with a long and proud tradition. It will play an important role in the vetting and nomination of judicial nominees, nominees or at least it has traditionally. So I want to ask you some questions about the court, starting with the current member of the court, about whom you've had a relatively a lot to say. Some of what you said, frankly, surprises me, and I want to give you an opportunity to clarify the record here. I'm talking about Justice Clarence Thomas. When you were in law school, you wrote an attack on Justice Thomas, saying that before he even took his seat on the United States Supreme Court, he was illegitimate. You said using the word justice with regard to Clarence Thomas was an oxymoron, and that uh, his decisions would never have any legitimacy. Those, that's... Quite a series of charges to make against a man like Justice Thomas, who's now stood on the court for quite a length of time. He's faced quite a lot in his life, I think. His life story is well known. His unique position on the court is well known. Uh, so let me just give you an opportunity here to address these very serious accusations. Do you regard Justice Thomas as an illegitimate member of the United States Supreme Court? I do not, Senator Hawley. Do you regard his opinions as illegitimate? I, I do not. Would you want to clarify your, your views now and, and what has changed uh, since you, you wrote, uh, you authored those attacks on Justice Thomas? Well, thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, it, we shared the same uh, law school, and I wrote uh, those comments in law school approximately 30 years ago at a time of a contentious uh, and momentous uh, nomination and confirmation hearing. Um, a lot of time has passed. I certainly acknowledged uh, immediately the uh, outcome of that. Uh, Justice Thomas was granted a lifetime appointment. I recognize his service on the court. I recognize the historic nature of his service on the court as the second African-American justice. I recognize that um, he has been an important figure in the law, and I have the highest regard 
for the United States Supreme Court, uh, for the justices who are confirmed to lifetime appointments, and I've uh, recognized that uh, throughout his time on the court. Good. So in other words, it sounds like to me what I hear you saying is that you, you would retract these comments and regret that you, that you made them those years ago. Right. I can't turn back time. Um, and again, those comments were made uh, 30 years ago when I was a student. Um, they, they do not uh, reflect my recognition of his service on the court and the importance of his service on the court. Good. Very good. Let me ask you about some other comments you've made about various Supreme Court cases. You've been a pretty fierce critic of the Supreme Court's cases, recent cases, regarding election integrity. Uh, you said that conservatives on the Supreme Court are a major barrier to your view of what ought to happen with election rules in this country. You've criticized the Crawford case, which was written by Justice Stevens, by the way, not a notable conservative. The Rucho case, RNC versus DNC, the McCutcheon case, Citizens United, the McDonald case, the Kelly case. Given your stance on these, I assume you're probably also a critic of the recent Brnovich case. It, it, it might have take from this that you will be an advocate for appointing judges and justices who will seek to overturn these decisions. No, Senator. The decision on who to nominate lies exclusively with the president. The Office of Legal Policy plays an important role, but a limited role. And, that it's, and it's similar to a role I played in North Carolina as the governor's chief legal counsel, which is to vet um, the background and qualifications of potential nominees for the president to be considered. Well, if I could just interrupt you there, but, but you and I both know that that's real, where the real work is done. I mean, the, it, the list that gets to the president, right, is uh, that's where the real spade work is done. So what I'm asking, you're going to play a very, if you're confirmed, you'll play a very important role in this process. You've been very outspoken and very critical about all of these cases. And it, you've been very fiercely critical of those who, on, on the Republican side of the aisle, who have fought for election integrity and of the United States Supreme Court. So let's come back to this again. Will you be an advocate for appointing judges and justices who will seek to overturn these decisions, the McCutcheon case, Citizens United, the McDonald case, the Crawford case? Uh, Senator, I recognize all of those cases as the law of the land. And I, I will say, Senator, that I do think in the area of public corruption, uh, the, but do you, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just my, we have a really short time or my time is almost over. I, what I'm asking you to think is, do you advocate that they be overturned? I, I understand you recognize them as the law of the land. Of course they are. They're controlling precedent. But the Supreme Court can revise its own precedent, as we know. So will you, you're going to have an important advisory role. Will you advocate for judges and justices who will seek to, to limit and overturn these cases that you've criticized so fiercely? Senator, I, I will not be an advocate in the role uh, that I hope to be confirmed for. Um, my time has expired. I'll have some more questions for you for the record. Thank you, Mr. Dellinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Well, welcome to uh, all of you. Um, I have two questions for the judicial candidates. And the first has to do with civil juries. From the acts of our revolution to the words of Blackstone, which in that era were so important uh, to our nascent legal community, um, Civil juries were central to our founding. And yet, we seem to see from the Supreme Court a pronounced effort to impede access to civil juries. That may go back to Blackstone's comment about civil juries, that they're a check on the wealthy and the powerful. And those of us who work in this legislative space understand that the wealthy and powerful have privileged fast lanes to get what they want done in Congress, and they can uh, apply political pressure to presidents and administrations. But when they come before a court, when they are in a courtroom, the hard square corners of the jury box demand that everyone be treated alike. And some folks don't like that. So I want your assurance that you will bring some understanding of the role of the civil jury in our constitutional structure uh, to your job as a judge that will be supervising civil juries with any luck. Right across the way, starting with Ms. Giles. Thank you for that question, Senator. I agree with you that juries are central to our legal system. And in my role as a judge, it would be to ensure that our juries uh, reflect a cross-section of our community and that when they serve, that they're going to be fair and unbiased. And doing conducting voir dire, it's my job to make sure that that jury is fair and unbiased. Judge Nachmanoff. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator. Uh, I agree. Juries are essential to our 
uh, civil and criminal justice system. One of the things I tell new citizens when I'm privileged to be able to swear in new citizens is that one of their rights and responsibilities is to be able to sit on juries. And so I'm a great believer in the value both for the jurors and for the system and those who are uh, the beneficiaries of it um, that, we, that we have jury trials. Ms. Nagala? Senator, I agree with uh, Ms. Giles and Judge Nachmanoff that s juries in, in civil and criminal cases are an essential feature of our constitutional system. Judge Williams. Thank you, Senator. This is uh, certainly a unique uh, aspect of our legal system throughout the world, and it's one that's incredibly important. I, I do recognize its importance. Thank you, Senator. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask, um, I had a telling conversation with a member of um, our circuit courts of appeal who described with um, some woe his sense that uh, he had colleagues who in their decisions were dedicating their efforts to auditioning for advancement. In my view, when a judge has parties before them in a case, the judge has a solemn duty to the parties before them to bring them justice and to follow the law and not to be auditioning for third parties outside of the courtroom with a view to political advancement. Could you offer me your views on auditioning as a proper role of a federal judge? I could not agree with you more, uh, Senator. The role of the judge is to decide the case and controversy uh, before the judge and not to, uh, you, the judge should never be thinking of any other issue or reason for deciding a case. Judge Nachmanoff. <clears throat> I could not agree more with Ms. Charles. Likewise, Mr. likewise, Senator. They said it well. And Judge Williams. Agreed, Senator. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be serving in a state where we're subject to reappointment every eight years but my decisions are based on the facts and circumstances in front of me in every case. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I think the next in our order is now Senator Kennedy, who I misled earlier about his spot in the order. So my apologies, Senator Kennedy, to recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ms. Giles, your son's name is Pierce? Yes, Senator. And is thank this? you for that kindness you've shown him. Well, I'm happy to. Is this Pierce right behind you here? Yes, it is. Mr. Pierce, you have anything you want to add to this? <laughs> How about vote for your mom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dellinger. I'm not going to ask you about what happened in law school. And I was glad to hear you talking about being nonpartisan. You must have had an epiphany. I want to read you a tweet. It's from 2019. You weren't in law school then, were you? I was not, Senator. How old were you then? Uh, I was, uh, I had passed over half a century. This is what the tweet says, yes. There are some women GOP peers, meaning members of the Republican Party, and a tiny number of Democrats who want government, not women, to control women's bodies. But if there were no Republican men in elected office, there would be no abortion bans. Did you write that? Senator, I, I do not recall that specific tweet, but I do not deny writing it. You wrote it. Okay. Here it is, bigger than Dallas. <laughs> do, 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 do you think that my votes with respect to abortion are based on the fact that I want to control women? Senator, I, I cannot speak to that. Well, why'd you say it in front of God and country? Well, Senator, I do believe that the reproductive rights established in Roe versus Wade and then, and then dealt with in Casey, uh, June Medical, and other uh, Supreme Court decisions are important. 
And that's, I, that, that's fine. I agree with that. Well, and Reasonable sen- people disagree, but that's not what you said, Counselor. Right. And Senator... You said every Republican, other than one, the ones that you like, have their position on abortion because they're misogynistic. Well, Senator, I... I Do you believe in God? Uh, Senator, I... I have faith, I believe. Um, I certainly... Some, a lot of people have faith. Right. Did it ever occur to you that, that some people may, may uh, base their, their position on abortion on their faith? Senator, I, I sincerely appreciate people who have a different um, position on abortion than I You sure I do. don't tweet it. Have you ever tweeted that? Well, well, Senator, I'm saying it now under oath, and I do... Yeah, you're up for, to be nominated. You want me to vote for you? Well, Senator, I, I, I am determined to tell the truth. And if I could make clear, Senator, I, and I appreciate your question, your concern, that Senator, I recognize the difference between someone saying something, you know, inartfully uh, as a private citizen and working as a lawyer. And I think I've got a 30-year track record of being open-minded. Okay, by I get process. all that. And, and just like I got to move on. We don't have much time, Counselor. Jeez. Do you believe the Justice Department is systemically racist? Senator, I, I believe every institution in our country exists on uh, a history. Yeah, but do you believe the Justice Department is systemically racist? Senator, if I could, I believe every institution in our country has dealt with racism and sexism. No, but and today, xenophobia. I agree with that. But I'm just asking a simple question. Today, do you believe the Justice Department is systemically racist? I do not believe the Justice okay. Department. What about is the act- law firm of Hampton Dellinger? That's your law firm. Is it systemically racist? Senator, I have done my best to. Simple try- question. Do you believe it's systemically racist? Right, and I'm trying to answer it, sir. I know. I- I think you're trying to dodge it, but you go ahead. Well, sir, I, I certainly do not try to uh, practice systemic racism. I do recognize... Neither do I. But is, is your law firm systemically racist? It is not. How about your law, former law firm, Boys Schiller? Are they, are they systemically racist? You got a bunch of racists there? Uh, certainly they have tried uh, to deal with implicit bias, to recognize it, and to remove any barriers. Are they systemically to, racist? I have no reason to think that they are. All right, I'm out of time. Man, that's not just one tweet, Counselor. You got a, a whole bunch of them here. Along with King Kong's arm. It, Senator Klobuchar. Just getting over King Kong's arm. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, uh, Mr. Dellinger, I just want to start by saying uh, what I need to know about you is that you are a friend and, and uh, of Chris Coons, um, who we all respect very much on this committee. Um, and um, I think you went to school with him. Is that right? I did. He was a year older uh, than me, and he was very nice to me when he didn't have to be. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, you and I talked on the phone about antitrust. Uh, do you want to talk about that? There's a lot of people on this uh, committee that care a lot about that, and uh, we have uh, gotten finally gotten a name of someone to head up the antitrust division over at the Justice Department, which will be before us soon, um, and um, we need to get started on these cases. Could you talk about your past experience with that, even though you wouldn't be overseeing that division? Yes, Senator Klobuchar, and thank you for the question, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you before. I think uh, antitrust is a critical area for uh, American law and for the American economy and for the American people. Uh, one of the first cases I did in the North Carolina Attorney General's office was uh, the suit against Microsoft when, in the 1990s when it was gaining um, a large amount of control and concentration over the internet, joining with your state of Minnesota in that effort. And I think at the end of the day, and we've also seen Senator Tillis, the consolidation in the agricultural industry, um, and I have very much been focused on small farmers in North Carolina, tobacco farmers, hog farmers. That's something that Senator Grassley and I talked about. And so that concentration in large sectors of the economy is, has to be a concern. And I very much am glad it's a concern, Senator, for you and for the Congress and for the president. We want innovation. 
and we don't want to impede innovation. We want companies to be successful, but it cannot be at the expense of consumers and of small business. And so while I would not be in a litigation, um, not have a litigation function if confirmed, I, I think from a policy perspective, assisting the Attorney General, uh, the administration, and if uh, appropriate, the Congress in dealing with concentration in sectors that may be limiting innovation and harming consumers uh, would very much be a focal point of mine. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nachmanoff, uh, prior to your selection um, um, to serve as a federal magistrate judge, right? You served as in the office of federal public defender. You represent hundreds of clients in uh, criminal proceedings. I guess my first question um, would more pertain to your magistrate time. Do you think experience matters in these jobs? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, I, I do think experience matters. I think experience can come from many different sources. Uh, I've been very privileged to serve as a magistrate judge in the, the court where I've been nominated to serve as a United States district judge. I know that my experience over the last six years working with the district judges and working on uh, those cases uh, would be of great benefit to me if I were fortunate enough to be confirmed. And how about your experience as a public defender? Thank you. Uh, likewise, uh, my, my uh, 26 years now almost of working in the Eastern District of Virginia, starting as a law clerk and then in private practice and then as a federal defender has all given me experiences working with clients and uh, working with all facets of the court, from appearing before the judges to working with probation officers and opposing counsel, um, that I think have aided me in my work as a magistrate judge and would be of great benefit to me if I were fortunate enough to be confirmed. Thank you. Um, Thank Ms. You. Giles, I know uh, that uh, you were a prosecutor, and um, I actually led the um, Abolish Human Trafficking Act with Senator Cornyn uh, many years ago, um, before a lot of people were talking about it. and. Um, I know that you, as the Assistant United States Attorney, led a number of prosecutions in human trafficking. Could you talk about your experience with those cases? Uh, yes. Thank you, Senator. Those cases are extremely important because the victims in those cases tend to be the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, children, uh, women who are either by force, fraud, or coercion um, forced into um, uh, prostitution and in doing those cases they were extremely rewarding because you are definitely doing a service to those victims and ensuring that they are not future victims and uh, those cases uh, definitely have benefited me personally but also in terms of what I've learned just in the process of, of dealing with victims thank you and I'll submit some other questions on uh, the record but I know that you um uh, Mr. Williams um, also, Judge Williams also uh, worked on uh, the Judicial Opioid Initiative, uh, which I, I thank you for. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kolbuchar. Senator Tillis. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll defer to uh, Senator Cotton. Follow him. Senator Cotton. Thank you. So magnanimous of you, Senator Tillis. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Dellinger, um, you stated. In De on December 16, 2019, that independent groups cannot, quote, engage in hate speech at federally funded schools without violating federal civil rights laws. What is hate speech? Well, Senator, I believe hate speech is speech directed at uh, a particular uh, ethnic group or nationality uh, intended to intimidate. We do not, um, you know, prosecute speech lightly. It never should. Um, prosecution should be focused on actions, but I do think there are certain instances where speech is directed at a, a racial or ethnic minority uh, with the intent to intimidate. And you, you think that violates our Constitution and federal civil rights laws? Senator, I think it can if, if it is intended to convey a threat um, to suggest well, a threat that... Is, a threat is different from hate speech. I'm, I'm asking, so I'm asking for a definition of... of Hate speech. Well, a clear, uh, a clear standard that a judge might apply. Senator, I I appreciate the uh, the difficulty of this area, and it's in North Carolina we have had a hate speech act, but 
when we see intimidation and threats that appear to be motivated by racial or other... Intimidations and threats are different. That's not hate speech. Well, it can be motivated out of hate, but in, but threats are a clear di and different legal standard. What I was going to—I'm I'm, I'm trying to figure out—you you didn't say threats and intimidation on December 16, 2009. You said hate speech at federally funded schools without violating federal civil rights laws. So I presume you have in mind some definition of what hate speech is. Well, Senator, I think I was—I had in mind what has been in statutes, and as I, the statutes I'm most familiar with, usually uh, ethnic intimidation. Um, will convey an enhanced or, or might have an enhanced penalty to it. I think prosecutors have to be very uh, careful in, in this area. I completely understand the First Amendment concerns and I, and I share them, but I do think whether it's the General Assembly in North Carolina or Congress has been willing to say that for certain types of intimidation or threats that seem to be motivated by racial or other impermissible animus, there can be an enhanced penalty. Does the Constitution allow the government to treat any American differently based on his or her skin color? It, it, it depends on, on what is being treated. If it is uh, identified discrimination based on race or, or gender or sexual orientation, then uh, under the Constitution, under Supreme Court precedents, that, um, you know, those characteristics can be considered in remedying that identified discrimination. To specific for a, a specific institution to remedy specific past discrimination. Well, that has been established before a court, and there's going to be a remedial effort to deal with it. That, that's my understanding, Senator. But in, in other instances, the government must, of course, treat all citizens equally, irrespective of their race. Well, Senator, you know that is going to be defined by the Supreme Court. Uh, I recognize there are a number of areas where. Um, neutrality is, um, is the best approach. You think about the t uh, Texas top 10% plan or raising the minimum wage. There are a number of areas where you may be able to address disparate historic treatment in a race or gender neutral way. Do you, believe with doc do you b agree with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that we should judge people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin? Yes. Um, Let's turn to a couple of Supreme Court decisions. You've uh, voiced your support repeatedly for Roe v. Wade. You, pr you believe that Roe v. Wade was correctly decided? I do, Senator. Do you believe that uh, D.C. versus Heller was correctly decided? I, I certainly, I, there has been a, a range of views about so The first that. one was very easy. The second one is not so easy. Can well, well, no, I, what I was going to say applies to both, which is there has been a range of uh, discussion and disputation about both decisions. So Roe v. Wade was very easy for you to say correctly decided. Why is D.C. versus Heller not so easy? Probably because you disagree with Heller, right? Well, sir, they're both the law of the land with Casey. Of no, no, they're the law. Well, I, I was, not up for a judge. Right. Not up to be a judge. Right. Like the, the office you're up for literally has policy in its title. I bet I could ask Judge Williams if he thought Marbury B. Madison was correctly decided. He'd probably say, I can't decide that. I can't say because I'm going to be a judge. That's well, why I'm I, asking you. I could. Literally, policy is in the title. Uh, what's the difference between Roe v. Wade, quick yes answer, D.C. v. Heller, a hedged answer? Is it because you don't agree with D.C. v. Heller? Uh, no, I, I, I might have, if I was a justice of the Supreme Court, which I will not be, um, I, I might have voted with the minority in that case, but that's not relevant to the position I've been nominated for. Uh, you know, Actually, it's very relevant. You're going to be reviewing all these judges. I bet you're going to try to find judges who share your views on D.C. v. Heller and the Second Amendment. It, anyway, my, my time's expired. Senator Tillis is very generous. We've got a vote to go to as well, so I'll yield back. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, um, and thank you uh, to my colleagues. If I might, given the uh, focus a number of my colleagues have uh, provided on uh, Mr. Dellinger and his background and his service, I thought I'd take just a moment uh, and share with uh, some of the other members of this committee why I am so enthusiastic about his nomination, if I might briefly, and I know I'm delaying my colleague, uh, Senator Tillerson, uh, Senator Blumenthal, we all need to get to go to the floor for a vote. Uh, but in reviewing uh, what you've done in the decade since we were law students together, uh, I was struck by two in particular letters in support of your nomination to lead the Office of Legal Policy, one from a group of faith leaders, one from a group of law enforcement leaders. Uh, two dozen faith leaders uh, who've known you for decades um, said throughout his career, Hampton's advocated for just causes and operated with care and concern for his fellow human beings, displaying the kind of compassion, humility, integrity we should demand for our public servants. 
Uh, they go on to say the country will benefit greatly from your generosity of spirit, something I think um, I look forward to seeing on display uh, in your leadership role in the Department of Justice, and a, a much larger group of law enforcement leaders, dozens of law enforcement leaders, um, talk about the high level of rigor and seriousness you will bring to the position um, and that you have demonstrated in their service alongside you uh, that you understand the challenges faced by law enforcement um, officers uh, and officials and take those concerns into account when developing policy. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say, Mr. Dellinger, before um, I conclude uh, about your experience advising the governor about the role uh, you will have in terms of forming legal policy? Uh, and was there anything else you wanted to speak to um, before I conclude and we all move on to a vote? Well, thank you, Senator Coons. And um, it, was, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that we were classmates together. Uh, I remember I couldn't get a date, and now I've got a 21-year-old uh, youngest child. Um, I do think it's important for you to know uh, and for all the senators to know that I recognize the role that I've been nominated for. It, it is not uh, my think tank. It, it, it's the attorney general's think tank. It's, it's not, you know, my policies. Um, it's the attorney general's policies, the Justice Department's leadership. There's also an important rulemaking function uh, that I would take very seriously, and I think the the rigor and detail one needs to try to succeed as a litigator, which is a very rule-bound uh, profession, is the type of rigor I would try to bring to the rulemaking function. And finally, with regard to the judicial uh, nomination process, you know, I was proud of the role I played in North Carolina, uh, vetting judges on occasion, trying to bring a potential nominee to the governor's attention. Um, one of the judges I'm most proudest of is Al Diaz, who uh, had served in the military courts as a judge, a defense attorney, and a prosecutor uh, in the JAG Corps. And he was a, a first in North Carolina. He was the first Hispanic judge uh, named to the Superior Court. But I also would say to the media, who would never quote this part, he was the best. He was the best qualified judge that, um, that I saw in, in terms of professional qualifications and has had a distinguished career. So, and my overriding focus was on integrity. Um, do, does a potential nominee have um, personal integrity, uh, show integrity in the workplace, uh, but above all, show integrity to the rule of law? And that would be absolutely my North Star, which is, is this potential nominee, does he have the integrity to understand and acknowledge the Constitution, the binding precedents of the Supreme Court? I certainly would. Um, you know, and again, I understand the difference between being um, a, a private citizen, uh, at times maybe saying things quickly or inartfully, uh, the professionalism one needs as a uh, practicing attorney, um, and then what's different about being in a law enforcement organization. And it's not just something I can talk about theoretically. I've been in a law enforcement organization as Deputy Attorney General in North Carolina. I recognize you have to have an overriding focus on independence, on um, being apolitical, being nonpartisan, and working with career employees and officials in both parties. And if fortunate enough to be confirmed, that's exactly what I would do. Thank you, Mr. Dellinger. I, for one, believe that uh, Attorney General Garland and our president will be well served by your advice. I look forward to supporting your nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Coons. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know the, the vote's coming up, but I think I can outrun you, so I won't be the last person voting. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Dellinger, thank you for being here. Um, you know, as I was hearing some of my colleagues uh, talk, I, I realized that I have a little bit different perspective, uh, mainly because we know so many people, we have so many mutual acquaintances. And I think it's very important for my colleagues to understand that I have heard from across the political spectrum uh, support for you. Um, so I'm not going to get into a lot of details. When, we, when you and I met in the office, thank you for spending the time that you did. I think that uh, you talked about your writings in law school. I think all of those should be discounted, uh, particularly if you come back and say you no longer stand by them. I can think of a million different things that I said back in the day that I would no longer say today. Um, you and I are going to have to agree to disagree on position on uh, reproductive rights. Uh, I've spent, you and I were walking the halls of uh, North Carolina legislative buildings and the governor's uh, executive offices at the same time. Uh, we passed bills that I thought made sense and promoted life. I think the difference is, in my, in my view, 
it's about the unborn child and it's the voice of the, uh, the unborn that motivates me to look at things to where we can make sure that um, families are properly informed and that we can preserve human life every, uh, to the maximum extent. I, uh, I do want a commitment from you though, as you're advising the White House on nominations, that you're looking deep into the records of those who are being nominated to make sure that they are people who will uphold the law and interpret the Constitution as written. Do I have your commitment to do that? Yes, Senator, you absolutely do. Um, I'm just being sensitive uh, to time. I wanted, uh, Mr. Williams, I wanted to tell you, I, I tend to watch where questions are directed, and I think you've got the fewest questions. You should consider that a very good sign. And to all of the nominees, uh, thank you all. Mr. Uh, Nachmanoff, I just had a real quick question. You know that I've, uh, in North Carolina, we did uh, the Justice Reinvestment Act early exit for uh, uh, persons incarcerated up here. I've supported efforts to try and make sense out of our uh, uh, criminal justice reform. Are you familiar with any of the things that we've been carrying through this committee and uh, have an opinion on them? Uh, no, uh, Senator, thank you for that question. I, I'm not familiar. Uh, in my present job, of course, I'm in a very different role, yeah. and so, so I can't speak to that. Well, I think you'd find if you uh, uh, study some of it, I think it's a, uh, an indication of bipartisan uh, support for making, uh, improving the situation. You all, I'm going to uh, yield back the rest of my time, but congratulations on your nominations. You should be very proud. I'm sure the folks uh, sitting behind you are very proud, and I uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Tellis. And Mr. Dellinger, I will be supporting your nomination. Senator, thank you. Thanks, Senator Tillis. Uh, we have a vote that is ongoing right now, so uh, in the absence of any objection, I'm going